Let's talk to um, a man who has been part of the success of this show over the last few years, uh, Carl Hennigan, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julian. Thank congratulations you. Thank on you the very, award. Very, very kind of you, sir. Well, congratulations on you and being a voice of sanity throughout the last few years. We certainly didn't get it from the former Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. We certainly didn't get it at his COVID inquiry appearance yesterday. Um, first of all, let's have a little clip of him um, apologising for every single death caused by COVID. I am profoundly sorry for the impact that had. I'm profoundly sorry for each death that has occurred. And I also understand why, for some, it will be hard to take that apology from me. I understand that. I get it. Um, but it is honest and heartfelt. And I'm not very good at talking about my... Uh, emotions and how I feel. All about emotions, all about saying sorry. OK, lots of people might appreciate the sorry. Lots of families uh, of COVID victims and others will not. But, Carl Hennigan, isn't it, isn't it time for everyone to stop talking emotions and talk about data and facts? Yeah, correct. Although I think that was what we call a political apology. It was not, I am sorry for what I did. I'm sorry because of the system and the other issues. Yeah. But I don't think all is lost here, Julia, because there was a bit yesterday where the KC said, look, what, what this module about is about pandemic preparedness. In module two, we'll start to look at whether these issues worked. <laughs> And what he's done throughout this first few weeks is actually get the government, all of these people, to go on the record and basically say we weren't prepared. Forget the fact whether the issues worked or not. The government machinery was complicated and actually it was pretty clueless. And we, and at time and time again, he's got them to go on the record and say, yeah, we didn't know what was going on. The yeah. machinery didn't work. And so actually these people, if you start to read the transcripts now, you start to go a government that's generally in disarray and going into the pandemic completely unprepared, just for simple things like what do we do if we need to have an increase in hospital beds? We have no idea about social care. He admitted yesterday he didn't even know how many care homes there were in England. So when you get that level of disarray, mm -hmm. you're starting to say the government machinery isn't working. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think that, you know, it's it's a lot of the civil servants and the advisors who actually fail to do their job. That's their job to do pandemic planning. That's the sort of stuff that you have a civil service that doesn't change with every government for. That's the point of it. They carry on with this stuff and they say to ministers, we need to have this, we need to have that. He claimed yesterday, so, you know, basically the concern for the pandemic planning was about having enough body bags. Where are we going to put all the dead bodies? Uh, and planning just for a flu pandemic as opposed to something like COVID, a SARS, MERS type disease. Um, can you explain to me, what planning would you, with hindsight or without hindsight, would you do differently for a COVID virus, like like virus, or as opposed to flu? Why would the planning be any different for those? I can understand for Ebola it'd be different, but why? So I think the KC, Mr Hallett, was looking at it and saying, look, actually what we need to plan for is acute respiratory pathogens and be flexible in our approach. So what does it look like? Like I said, if we need 30, 40 percent more hospital beds, yeah. let's have a practice this winter. What does it look like if care homes, we need to increase the number of people who care for people? The clinical load will go up in general practice. What's the plan? How do we ensure people still access services while around us they're feeling frightened and mm. scared? I'd also look at things like the cost consequences. What happens if we close schools? Can we model that? How much will it cost us? What will be the downstream costs? So all of that will go into the plan. Yeah. And then finally, Julia, what I would do is do some studies, some evidence, and try and work out in the intervening years, there are coronaviruses circulating. Can we trial mass, for instance, in schools and see if they make a difference this winter? But no, we're not going to go there. No, exactly. Well, let's just do another clip. And, and this is Matt Hancock telling the inquiry that UK must be ready to lock down sooner the next time we have a pandemic. I mean, absolutely terrifying words. Here's what he had to say. We've got to be ready to hit a pandemic hard, that we've got to be able to take action, lockdown action if necessary, that is wider, earlier, more uh, stringent than feels comfortable at the time. And the failure to plan for that was a much bigger flaw in the strategy than the fact that it was targeted at the wrong disease. 
I genuinely find those words so terrifying and chilling, Carl Hennigan. Um, and it's interesting, Isabel Oakeshott, who we're going to talk to you later, who's, of course, the whistleblower for the lockdown files, she worked with Matt Hancock on his book, got hold of those WhatsApps for everything but March 2020, crucially. We don't know if those have even been handed over to the inquiry. We hope so. Um, uh, when she and, and, and she says that at no point in the entire year she worked for him did he ever work with him, did he ever make a, the argument that he's making at the COVID inquiry, which is that the single biggest mistake was that they didn't lock down quick enough. Uh, and hard enough. He's never made that, not in private, never made that, and this is what he's saying at the inquiry. But we know this has been the line that we, many of us who fought against lockdowns are, are fearing that the inquiry is going to focus on. Um, do you find it, as I do, extraordinary that anyone looking at the facts uh, now and anyone knowing what we know now and should have known and many did know before lockdown started and in the early stages of them, that, that, that someone like Matt Hancock is saying that we should have done it harder, sooner, and we should do it again. Yeah, so there's lots happening here. After the event, he's changing his story. Second is he's inflexible. There's no reflection, like you say. And third is there's no looking at the evidence around you. Let's even forget Sweden. What about the other countries in Europe? We don't see they look down harder and earlier. They didn't come out of this with sort of smelling of roses. So the problem here is across the politicians, they look for a very simple answer and then attach themselves to that. And it's mm -hmm. if only we did this, everything would have been all right. And then I would have come out of this all right. So it's not my fault, yeah. not my problem. I'm not apologising for what I did. I'm apologising that we didn't lock down earlier. I agree with you that that's chilling because the key, though, is we've got to dissect that now and pull it apart and say, let's look at the evidence and the data. And I'm hoping that will happen in Module 2. Yeah, and again, this is going to go on for years. This is very early stages. I, I personally found it quite frustrating when I have watched the committee, so the, the inquiry hearings. There doesn't seem to be much sort of uh, probing of what uh, politicians have been saying. They're giving opinion. It's like, OK, well, what evidence do you have that opinion? It, it's extraordinary to me uh, that, that people always say, well, it's what someone said as opposed to the evidence for what they're saying. Um, it, 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 he did say, um, you know, that there'd been a failure to plan for lockdowns and, and that we should lock down again. Um, the crucial thing is, is he, he actually criticised the planners for not having planned for lockdown, but it, lockdowns had never been considered. They were never discussed by SAGE, uh, the committee advising the government. They, they had never been considered by the World Health Organization or by our pre-pandemic planners for a very good reason, hadn't they? It was, it was known that there would be huge long-term costs of, across the board of locking down, which is why this idea had been thrown out long before. I think if they were fully prepared, that would have happened. The economic models and the cost consequences would have looked at the issue and said, look, if you're going to do this, you could probably get away with it for a couple of days, maybe a week. And if you remember, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah. The problem is once you rolled it out, then everybody from the sidelines and the laptop classes said, we've got to stay in lockdown until we get rid of every single case. Yeah. And so it was months. And then we had another one and a third one. People got the appetite and the taste for it. So you're right. I think, though, if we'd have done our homework, we'd have looked at it very differently and said, look, here's what's going to happen. Two or three down, years down the line, you'll have spent that much money. Your government's going to be in disarray and you're going to get on it. You're not going to get reelected because you've run out of money. Look, the impact on schools, mental well-being. You put all that into the mix, they would have looked at it and gone, hmm, maybe a couple of days, but that's the maximum. Yeah, and again, what frightens me is also Matt Hancock talking about we could have been able to stop the virus. China locked down I mean, they were locked, they were physically bolting people into their homes, for God's sake. People died in mm. fires because they couldn't escape. They were, locked, they were locked down very early, millions, hundreds of millions of people for months and months on end. I mean, yeah, everyone in hazmat suits, testing every day. They didn't stop the virus. The death rate in China, we will never know, will we? But there are body bags piling up there, we know. Countries like New Zealand and Australia uh, you know, locked down very early. Oh, the idea was you'd lock down quickly and then you'd be out, it'd be fine. We we're constantly told if we'd done that sooner, they were in lockdown for months and months on end. And what a surprise, they still got hit by the virus and now seeing excess deaths of all kinds. 
So I think there's a sort of lack of experience, lack of expertise, and this approach, which is a simplistic answer to a virus, is yeah. we can suppress it out of out of the environment. And I just think that's a misnomer that has to be got onto. You see, the problem with that approach is think about it in care homes. What it does then is say, well, we're not going to put extra clinical care in. We're not going to put resources. What we're going to do is stop it at the front door. And that utterly failed. In the first wave, we had about 40% of care homes infected within the first few weeks. So it didn't work. Yeah. So while we were all sat at home, the young people feeling safe and secure, the exact people you wanted to stop the virus were yeah. being killed by this in their droves. So this is the problem now. Where do you put your resources? And what it's showing is within the NHS is we weren't resourced, we weren't able to be flexible, and we weren't able to look after people when they needed it most. Absolutely. Claire, uh, Carl Hannigan, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at University of Oxford, thank you so much. Uh, Russell Quirk? I, I think it's astonishing that we are definitely seemingly not going to learn the lessons. The fact that there was never any proper kind of risk versus consequence mm. assessment done in terms of the effects on things like mental health, the economy, Even when jobs. demanded by MPs. Yeah, suicides increasing, the fact that you know cancer patients, heart patients were clearly going to die as a consequence of not facing treatment um, it really is quite incredible to me. Um, and, and the fact that some of us, two years ago, three years ago, were talking about maybe herd immunity is the answer. And we were shouted yeah, down. All, we were shouted all down viruses as, basically well, end with herd dissipate, immunity. Because they but, dissipate. And, yeah. and, you know, lock up those that are very, very vulnerable. But no, no, don't, don't, don't lock up anybody. Well, well, in my opinion. No, but, because, but, no my, my, no, my mum's in her late 70s. She says, I don't want to live my life yeah, like this. No, it's but, not but worth certainly it. certainly advise them to. But, of course, the 95% of the population that were never going to die from COVID didn't need to be affected yeah. by any of this. Your survival rate in your 90s with three comorbidities, your survival rate is still over 90%. Yeah, we've learned I'm, nothing. I'm sorry. They, this is the worry. They haven't learned anything at all. 8.20 is the time. Someone who's actually on the right side of history on this is Craig McKinley. We're going to talk to him up next. Also about uh, NHS uh, strikes coming up. Uh, and, oh, yeah, uh, net zero. I mean, we've got a lot to get through. Let's get to the break and get back. This is Talk Breakfast.